Hello, I'm going to tell you how we use Rust inside the JVM application. And at this moment, you're probably full of questions like how, why, who are you? I will answer them in a reverse order. I'm Bogdan, I'm a software engineer, enough about me. I work at the fleet optimization team at Moya and we drive these beautiful golden buses and we provide a right pooling service. New questions. What is a right pooling and how is it different from the pool riding? Imagine you want home. It happens sometimes. And there is a vehicle that can take you from the stop near where you are to the stop near your home and deliver you. And it can deliver other passengers in the meantime. That's right pooling. We have once we make routes for them dynamically depending on the requests from the people. And that's also what our team does. We do optimization problem. We have the whole city of vehicles. We have the whole city of trips. And we try to assign trips to vehicles to make everyone happy. Optimization problems are hard, like NP hard. It means that there are many feasible solutions, but some of them are better than other ones. And if you get one solution, you cannot know if it's the best one or not. To make sure it's the best one, usually you have to compare it to every other possible solution. And it might take years. And we need to solve this problem every few seconds. We need to do it in you. But usually, optimization problems are quite common and they have common solutions. And one thing is, try as many solutions as possible within a time limit and return the best one you could find in this time. And this kind of solving the problem so general, so we have general solvers for optimization problem. And some of them are even open source. So we used one of them. It's a Java library called OptoPlanner, open source solver. And when we need to set up everything quickly, we just build a Scala service around this library. And if you know, don't know what is Scala, it's a functional programming language that runs in JVM. So it can use the features of Java, it can use the libraries of Java. And during this talk, in your head, you can just replace every occurrence of the Scala word with Java, and it will be okay, although it's completely wrong. But let's get back to our OptoPlanner. We run it, it gives us some answer, and we can either accept it or we can, actually, that's everything we can do. We don't know why exactly this answer. We don't know what other answers were considered and why this one was picked. We have very little control over how fast it finds this answer and how it finds the answer. And this, if there is a word optimization in your team name, it means you have very little control over the only thing you are supposed to do. And that's bad. That's why we decided to rewrite our optimizer to make it domain specific, which means we can make it prob make a problem specific optimizations for it to make it better, to find better solutions, to find them faster. And also we want to control what's happening and we want to know what's happening. And observability is an important part. And that's why we decided to rewrite it in Rust, surprise because it's, the language is fast and suddenly that's important if you want to fit as many operations as possible within a fixed time limit. It has memory safety and nice high level features, meaning the development is fast when you want to implement an algorithm, the language won't stand in your way. And you, can, you have a permission to use a rocket emoji for your whole lifetime, which is also important. And in general, Moya loves Rust with love proven by laptop stickers. It's not the first implementation in Rust in our company, not the last one, and everyone's happy so far. But the writing takes time. 
rewriting big things takes a lot of time. And every time you just finished rewriting something and you're switching, there's a small chance, sometimes not small, to crush your whole service in production at the moment of this switch. And the bigger change you made, the bigger the chance is to break everything, put everything on fire. And our service is quite big. There's a lot of small text over here. You don't have to read it, it's quite boring. But the main part is the optimizer we want to rewrite is one single blue box in the middle. And there's a lot of stuff going on around it because our clients, which are other teams in the company, they don't think in terms of optimization problem. That's why we need to consume events, send them to DynamoDB. Every time we get a request, we need to load additional data from DynamoDB, aggregate everything. There's a decision tree involved. Then we map everything to real optimization problem, run optimization. And then we have the same problem because our clients don't think in terms of optimization solution. So we have to map everything back. And there's a lot of stuff going on. So rewriting optimizer is very good. It provides us a lot of business value. Rewriting everything else, eh, it's already good. So by wasting time or rewriting it, we just waste time and we just increase the chance of making everything burn. So in two words, green part, good to rewrite, red part, bad to rewrite. And it's all a single application. And I use computer graphics to make red part look much bigger than green one. Now, how about we rewrite only green part and say, okay, we're done. It would mean that we use two languages in the same application. Is it possible? Yes. Yeah. For you, the title of the talk is already a spoiler. For us, it was a mystery for about five minutes of Googling. Then it turned out, yes, it's possible. Because of JNI, it's a Java native interface. Think that lets Java applications call native libraries and vice versa. Think that lets C++ or C applications call Java libraries. Looks like it was done long time ago to simplify migration from the C++ basis to Java, but it's still supported and it's still used mostly by Android developers. Looks like they don't want to write Java and they want to write Rust instead. I cannot blame them for this. So we can use JNI. So how to do this? The schema is something like this. You have a lot of Java code and when you pass it to, through Java compiler, you can get the Java binary and also header files for C or C++ programs. Then you write implementation for these header files in C++. You compile it and yeah, you get a binary native library that's, that can work together with Java and they support it. There's one problem in this schema and it's not that it looks like a very complex procedure, but the fact is we don't want to write C++, we want to write Rust and it's never mentioned here. But Rust has a single solution for every kind of such problem, macros. There are some nice crates for supporting JNI in Rust. We use Robusta JNI because it doesn't depend on this header file. So instead you have two files, hope you can read it but if you're not, you're not losing much. Below you have the Scala part, which is a class with a single function, string to string function there without any implementation. Instead it has, it has a native attribute, which means implementation is somewhere, trust me, I'm an engineer. And above you have the same struct with the same name, with the same function, and some boilerplate and macro calls copy pasted from example of Robusta GNI. And that's all you have to do. It works together, nice. 
it supports much more complex things like a, than a single function that is string to string. You can have multiple functions. You can save some state between the calls and reuse it when your library is called next, but you don't have to use it. The one difference is on Scala you have a string to string function and in Rust you have string to result of string and it will be important later. But in general, it's a proof of concept. It works nice. Now we can think how to implement it in the real application, which means how to connect optimizer and coordinator. And coordinator is all the application except optimizer. And when you think about how to do this, where to place code, there are some contradicting uh, wishes you can have. For example, you want to store optimizer and coordinator in different repositories because these are different applications written in different languages. But at the same time, you want Rust and Scala interface for the optimizer to be in the same repository because otherwise it would be very hard to keep them in sync. Also, you want to run coordinator locally or in CI or on production. You want to use optimizer inside it and you need to have a different builds because Rust is not working on the virtual machine, you need to build it specifically for operational system. And it means on dev computers we have Mac, on production and in CI we have Linux, and we want optimizer to work in both, both cases. So, result was quite tricky. Here's a schema for it. We have a very small Scala library that provides the same interface as the Rust optimizer, and it's in the same repository with the Rust optimizer, but it doesn't do anything. It just forwards the request to the Rust implementation. But then everything is packed as a single Scala library, deployed as a Scala library, and coordinator depends on it as on a Scala library. So it doesn't even know that there is a Rust inside, which is quite good for the client's feature us in this case, but still good. Build process in this case is also interesting. You have Rust code. We compile it in both operational systems we care about, so Linux and Mac. And then we take these binaries and add them to resources of the Scala library when we build it. So it's kind of static assets. So everything gets packed in the one big jar file we send to the dependency repository then. And it works nice. Scala library, when it gets request, it loads the Rust library that is much in the current operational system and forwards the request there. Now, some technical details. Passing data. We have a string to string function. In reality, of course, our optimization problems and optimization solutions are much more complex than usual strings. And GNA has some mapping stuff. So you can map types from Java to Rust. You can even map arrays and objects and nested structures. Probably we didn't bother doing it because it looks complex and it looks like a tedious work that is very technology specific. So if you want tomorrow to make optimizer as a separate application running and serving network requests, we will have to throw away this part of code and rewrite everything in somehow another way. So instead, we used protobuf. We defined protobuf messages in the same repository. And during the build, we generate the Rust code and we generate the Scala code, both in the same repository. And now, if, when our Scala library wants to call a Rust library, it encodes everything in protobuf, turns it into a string, passes the string, and then Rust decodes it. And this is perfectly in sync because everything is in the same repository and it works pretty good. Next thing is error handling. And here we have one problem. When Rust panics, we cannot do anything about it on the Java side. It just crashes the, the whole application. And 
it's quite bad when you have long running applications that are supposed to live even if there are errors. And uh, how can we solve this? It, don't panic. Just don't. Reference to the Hitchhiker's Guide of to the Galaxy. Double check. Now we need to have a fallback for every case where something might go wrong, and it turned out to be a surprisingly simple because our Rust application doesn't have any external calls. So there might, cannot be any network issues. It gets already type data and we can enforce some type checks on the Scala side. So really there are no much reasons to panic, but even if there are some, we return GNI result. And so it means we can return an error. And in this case, robust GNI will throw a Java exception. And that's something we can handle easily. Next thing. Observability, something we care about very much. And uh, how we solve it? No nice schema for you. So instead, I asked Dali to draw a picture with symbolism. We have an optimizer here. And the only side effect it's allowed to do is to write logs. Also, it records metrics in a variable and it returns them together with an optimization solution. So Scala application data can decide how to record them and what to do with them. And that's all the problems we have. And suddenly the change was even smaller because we managed to run both optimizers in the same coordinator for a while in parallel and just lock up both requests and use the request from the old optimizer and compare it with request uh, and compare it with the response from the new optimizer. So we could do this shadow run. We could check for the bugs. There was plenty of them. We could fix them and only do a real switch only when we were confident enough with results that we are doing. So we can do the switch without crashing everything. And while we were experimenting with this, because it was in the single application. No one noticed we're doing this. That's impressive. Was please. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> As a result, it's proven in production. It works for more than a year, and we never had problems with this thing after the first implementation. We get the best from both languages, so Rust goes fast and Scala does networking and Amazon issues. Turns out we managed to avoid all the scariest parts of Rust. And negative parts is we have to know and be eager to use both languages, which makes hiring a bit harder, but okay. And in general, the whole moral, probably you will never came, come up with such architecture from the scratch on a greenfield, but you can gradually migrate your existing JVM-based application to the Rust without anyone noticing. That's the big thing you can remember. Thank you.